It's moving day. You glimpse your new home as you turn on to your new street. But this apartment, this trailer, this three-story mansion, whatever it is you're moving into, it's had an entire life of its own before you signed your name to it. What secrets slither beneath the floorboards? What forms take shape inside its walls? And what forces, long dormant, now wake and stir as you slide your key into the lock? Join us as we step over the threshold, spread some salt, and peer in to the gloom to discover untold encounters of new home haunts and house key creepers. Conspiracy, synchronicity, Sasquatch, homunculus, alien races, Satanism in Hollywood, MK Ultra, Tartaria. There's like a whole. I've been watching this one guy. Like, Close the door, in. Jury, in. close your door. What's the uh, inner Earth disagreements? Ghost Dad. <laughs> I like that movie. Dogman, Bohemian Grove, Corey Feldman, magicians are demons, specters, and spirit spooks. summonings, Sleep paralysis, Sleep paralysis. strange disappearances, sky whale phenomena, yes. alternative history, shadow people. Shh, quiet. I'm trying to say words with the mouth. It's getting dicey out there. Poltergeists. That's cool. Anunnaki. What is the moon? <laughs> Elf towers. I would never talk about it. That's old. Y2K. Cover-ups. Apocalyptic catastrophe. Vampire. Vampire. Well, hello, hello. Hi. Welcome to Belief Hole. I'm Jeremy. I'm John. And I'm Chris. And we are the brothers of the Belief Hole. And today is a very special day. It is. It is our first day in our very new, well, very old, but new to us, studio for the show. Yay! We're excited. It's still so new that it's not even really set up yet. Yeah. yeah. No, the only thing we have set up are microphones and a couple chairs, a couple lamps, and a table. But we will be showing it off to you guys as we get more and more ready. It is an awesome space. It is. Well, you manifested this, John. Weren't you dreaming of something like this? It is very similar to my ideal, at least setup. I'm not super sure about the sound right now. Yeah. <laughs> We've got some unexpected sound anomalies happening, so we're still trying to sort that out. But as far as the space goes, it's very cool. The loft is nice. It's a huge old Ghostbusters <laughs> Model <laughs> T Ford. It. Well, it has a weird history. It has a very weird yeah. history. Yeah. Chris, what do you know? You know a little bit about this history, don't you? A little bit. Um, our family friend, Linda, she informed us that it was the Hammerson building years ago, and but it is a built in the 1880s, and uh, you can definitely tell, especially when you're in our section, which is sort of this back end, unfinished, all wooden brick. You can see the holes from the original beams coming out of the brick, and very unconventionally built place, too, as far as we're in this kind of half loft sitting above kind of the view of the lower area, which will be like the studio, the editing and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, it's really, it's an interesting space, but uh, synchronistically, you said 1880s? Yeah. That's so weird. Our first story is from 1884 and it's about moving in. Perfect. Oh yeah. Tell us why we're doing this episode, Jer. Yeah. I thought that this would be a perfect opportunity to do new home horror stories or basically the unsettling things that happen in the unfamiliar places, a place that's new to you like this studio for us. It's a new place, a little strange, very mysterious. No spooky vibes yet. We did hear the ghostly cries of a young child last night and <laughs> realized it was just a precocious neighbor. neighbor, A neighborling. Just a human. Just an annoying human. <laughs> that we will have to muffle out somehow for the recordings. No, but we are excited to get this place all set up and we will be posting pictures and stuff. Yeah. Oh yes, yeah, so and before we get to that story, Jeremy, I just wanted to say it feels good to be back in our hometown. It does. We're mystery was first formed in our minds where we enjoyed the creepy stuff growing up. And there's some, we all know tales from this area, which, oh yeah. By the way, if anybody out there is listening and has stories from this, I know it's a specific area, but if you happen to be from the area and know anybody who is or was and has had a strange experience, I think this year we're finally going to do it. We're going to do some sort of Canal Fulton, Phantasmagoria, hometown haunt episode. Yeah. 
you know, we grew up in this town, but it is supposed to be, I just read this recently, one of the most haunted towns in Ohio. And what? the which blows my mind, the we'll get into this on the episode when we do that episode this Halloween. Uh, Lock 4 is supposed to be the most haunted place in Ohio. Really? Yeah, because of the story that happened with the lock keeper. We'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, really interesting. But I didn't know the public library, which is such has a special Didn't it eat a baby? Place. The public library ate a baby. It did. Yes. No, the lock foreman. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, we'll get into that. But that used to be a mortuary. And it is haunted also. The library was a mortuary? Mm-hmm. Anyways, yeah, there's going to be a lot of folklore in this area for sure. Yeah, on the canal. And we live inside of it now. Before we get into the actual episode, we do need to make a quick announcement that we are taking a week to actually set up the studio. Yeah. Uh, so, so sorry, we, I know you guys are going to miss us and I hate taking time off from the show, but it kind of has to be done. Yeah, because we have to be able to work here to make a show for you. Yes. And right now it is bare bones, just barely, we're barely in here to record this and we just need, we need to make the studio a studio. So we're not taking a break technically, we're just pushing the schedule back one week. Yes, one week. So, but we're doing it for you. Yes, we love you. Let's get into the episode. All right. Any ghosts in the room? Please make your voice heard on the microphones throughout the course of today. Yes. Listen closely. Okay. Dear listener. <laughs> That's stupid. Did you guys hear that? It's very compliant spook. <laughs> oh, that reminds me. This is important. John, I brought home a uh, clock radio from grandma's house. Oh, yeah. And I've kept it next to my bed. And every night, it's off. It's like the light's on, but the radio's off. And every night, it goes, at random times, it'll go... What? Yeah, like the radio? The radio. Yeah, I can't do a good radio mouth <laughs> noise. But the other night it went off and as I was drifting asleep, and I didn't put the connection with grandma together, but I, as I was falling asleep, I heard the sound again. And in my mind's eye, I saw a woman, old woman with her mouth open. Like she was talking with the static. It's really crazy. She's trying to get to I you. I don't think it's grandma, but... Better hope not. Imposter. <laughs> Wouldn't be your first grandma imposter, would it? That's true. I have a history of grandma yeah. imposter entities. Anyway, I just thought I would mention that because it was a really creepy thing that's been happening to me lately. I did check the radio, John, and the only way to make that noise physically is to turn the knob up and back quick. Up and back quick. Up and back quick. But I looked and the knob isn't moving, so it must be something inside. Anyways, I'll put a picture in the show notes of the clock radio. It's one of those cool old, oh, like... Grandma opening her mouth and closing it? <laughs> I'll put a picture of <laughs> mid-journey that and I'll put it next to the clock radio. <laughs> Anyways... All right, this first story is uh, synchronistic, as I said, because I didn't realize this, but it is from the same period that this building we are now in was built, the late 1800s. This story comes from 1884, and you guys may have heard of this book. It comes from a book called Phantasms of the Living. Yeah, we've used this book before because it's a, uh, it's a classic. Yeah, this is a vintage 1886 piece of work, Phantasms of the Living, and it documented alleged sightings of apparitions. The two volumes consist of 701 cases of alleged spontaneous apparitional communications. It also explored a telepathic theory to explain such cases. And the author, Edmund Gurney, and his co-authors were early psychical researchers. But this is a crazy book. We'll put a link in the show notes and images. Uh, it's this just old classic tome. It's the early edition of listener stories of what we do here, collecting real accounts. Yeah, it's kind of perfect for today. Yeah, it's perfect. Late 1800s. But I love this story. It just has a voice of the time. You'll pick it up. It reminds me of like reading a Jane Austen novel, uh, which I am off to do. Nathaniel Hawthorne, maybe. So we, okay, so there are three sisters. So I figured we could each read the voice of one of the sisters in these stories. Chris, you will be the voice of Sarah. John, you're Lizzie. And I will be Hannah. This was submitted or took place on February 17th, 1884. And I like the little side note here from the author. He says, the narrator of the next experience requests that her name may not appear. In other words, this comes from an anonymous listener, as we would say. Shortly after my marriage, about the year 1847, I went to stay at my father's house. I had at the time two sisters at home, unmarried. The elder of the two was nearly two years younger than myself and would therefore be about 22 years of age at the time I speak of. The other sister was much younger than us both and at this time was about 14 years old. My two sisters slept together in a room adjoining mine. One morning, on my going down to breakfast, my elder sister said to me, quote, Sarah, such a strange thing happened in the night. I was sleeping on the outside of the bed, and the bed was against the wall, and I was awoke by a feeling of oppression at my chest, <laughs> as though there was a weight there, and I couldn't breathe. On opening my eyes, I was startled to see a veiled figure bending over me. I felt Anna's arm come around me. 
After what seemed to be a few minutes, the form disappeared. Then Anna whispered, Oh, Lizzie, I thought it was going to take you away. This was my sister's account. I took an opportunity when my sister and I were alone to ask her what that was that she and Lizzie had seen. She said she was awoke by a feeling of oppression, as though she could not breathe. And on opening her eyes, in the dim light of the room, the blind was down, but there was a gas lamp in front of the house, which gave some light to the room. She saw a veiled figure bending over Lizzie. And she put her arm around her as she thought it had come to take her away. My father and his family shortly after moved into a house, my sister still occupying a room together. They assured me that once in this house, they were visited by the same appearance. But this time, it was over Anna. She only lived a short time after, dying at 16 and a half. On sending this account to my sister, in case I might, through lapse of time, have altered the matter, she assures me it is substantially correct and adds that the form was gray, darker and thicker in the middle. She also adds that the feeling of horror was intense. Unfortunately, the sister's letter was destroyed that she referenced. Man, I can really relate to that story, not just because it took place about the same year that this building was built that we're now in, but also three sisters, mm -hmm. we're three brothers. Uh, it's pretty heartbreaking when I was rereading that and editing it last night. The fact that these sisters all shared a room, or at least two of them did, and they shared a house. And it's like us. <laughs> you get the typical, well, I called it sister hag, but it's really a hag of the sisters. This nightly knockmare hag thing. We always hear this oppression of the chest. This veiled woman appears. And the corroboration, not only does, uh, I think it was Lizzie that saw it, but so did Anna. And that's the best part is that her sister was next to her and basically grabbed her because she was worried that this woman was, was going to take her away. Yeah. Yeah. That is heartbreaking though. She was like, I thought she was going to take you. And then later in another house, the same figure returns, but then over Anna this time. And then Anna dies shortly after. Yeah. Sad, very sad. This thing followed them from house to house. Yeah. So even if you move to a new place like we did here, things can follow. So it always brings us back to that question. Is a place haunted or are people or both? Yeah. I think it's both. Yeah, it definitely can be both. It's weird. I almost brought in a story from a listener that was a, moved into a new house story and it involved a veiled woman. Oh, weird. So it kind of would have worked perfectly. What is with this veiled woman? Yeah. Who is she and what does she want? Anyway, so this is a tale that we've heard similar stories of, but I just love that it's from the 1800s. These things are timeless. Yeah. Usually these stories often get immediately refuted as uh, sleep paralysis. Yeah. But this has the sister there seeing the same thing. Yeah. So there is something to that oppression on the chest that's not always uh, sleep paralysis hallucination, mm -hmm. hypnagogic hallucination. And uh, before we move on to the next story, I wanted to mention, John, I think I told you that my initial concept for this was going to be a lot of uh, haunting of new homes of the living kind. Like the... Uh, like froggers? Frogging, we talked about. So a lot of these new home horror stories are that. They're real, almost true crimey. They're uh, accounts of people living inside the home without someone knowing and then coming out at night. We covered this before. We might even drop at the end as a special treat one we've done in the expansion. So if you guys are interested to sign up for the expansion, hear more of those. We've done an episode like that. But I did hear this one account of a woman who had recently moved into a home, an apartment complex, and she was hearing things moving at night, you know, almost like poltergeist activity, footsteps creaking, but too scared to go out and look. And she'd wake up the next day, find things moved around the home. And then one week, her brother moves in just for a week. I think he was working in town. All the activity stops at that point. The brother moves out a couple weeks later. Activity starts again. Until one night, she's laying in her bed, wakes up to a creak at her, the opening of her bedroom. And there's a man standing there staring at her. And the guy notices that she's waking up and he bolts out of the room. 
she bolts out of the room to try to get to her kitchen to get her phone. And she sees the man trying to get into a cupboard, assuming he's hiding there so that, you know, he won't be seen. She calls the cops, runs out of the place. Cops get there, go inside, find out that the man had made a door between his apartment and hers and had been going through the cupboard every night. Well, that's lovely. <laughs> yeah, terrifying stuff. So check all of your cupboards <laughs> when you move in a place that's adjoined to another building. We have a crawl space in the basement here that looks like someone oh, could be dude. living in. There's a crawl space there? Oh, you underneath, you mean? Yeah. We've got a crawl space below. We've got, I don't know if you see that wall over there, John, behind you above the kitchen cabinets. That's all open space too. There's a little crawl space in the laundry room slash bathroom there you can get into. That's probably like six foot high. So there are spaces here for sure. <laughs> Creepy. Uh, <laughs> anyway, when we're late night editing here, it'll be interesting yeah. if you hear any footsteps. But um, I just want to mention that because a lot of people expect those kinds of stories. So we may drop one in later in this episode. There'll be more in the expansion too. Yeah, for sure. But this next story, I love this story. Oh, this is great. John, I want you to read this guy. This is from a listener, right? It is. And the listener would like to remain anonymous. I call this deadbolts on the closet doors. We'll have the whole listener story that they submitted in our, on our website because it's very long. I cut it down for this episode, but they want to remain anonymous and they wanted their family to remain anonymous. So uh, they refer to themselves as four and their brother as two in the story. So that's when you hear the name like two or four. That's what that is. They go on to say that they've seen a lot of strange things and they, it was hard to know where to start. But again, the full story on our website. So I'll just cut to the meat, cut to this very creepy part of the story and the experience. We can call me two for namesake. I don't want any info out there in my name, really. A lot of this is going to make me sound insane, and I get that. But I found some comfort when I found this podcast to make me feel not alone in this weird-ass life. True that. So that makes me very thankful. But again, I don't know really where to start. I've seen a lot of weird stuff, and I mean weird stuff. Stuff I have not told anyone about, and some stuff I refuse to talk about. I should start at the beginning. Despite my mother and father's troubled history, they managed to do very well for themselves in our small town in Oklahoma. I am one of four kids. We grew up on a ranch with around 200 acres, lots of fun toys, lots of fun stuff to do. The possibilities were basically endless at this castle my father had built. My father and mother bought up this land in the late 2000s with hopes of building their dream home. And boy, did they. It was huge. Two stories with an attic, massive pool, nine bedrooms, 10 baths. It was the house to have people over too. No neighbors for miles. This sounds like where I want to live. Right? <laughs> and on the back side, it bordered the Wichita Mountains. Man, do I have some stories from out here. It was a dream house, basically. Growing up, my mother quickly realized that my youngest brother and I were much like her in the sense that we were sensitive to certain things. A defining moment in my childhood is my mom sitting me down and telling me that life for me would be very different and that I may hear things and see things that others cannot. She warned me to not always trust them and didn't say much more on it ever again. I was eight. In that perfect house that my parents had made, we all heard things. Not all of us saw things, but every single one of us heard things. And we all to this day believe that was the most haunted place we lived. Growing up, I never considered why all of the closets had deadbolts on the outside of the doors. Nonetheless, I thought maybe they were just the cheap kind of doors that sway or something. I never thought much of it except we all routinely locked them. For as long as I can remember, all of my siblings would lock the door before getting into bed as per the request of my parents. None of us were the type to disobey orders, especially easy ones like that. What a weird thing. Mm -hmm. One night, I can remember specifically, I got a really weird feeling locking the door. Not just a, hmm, weird, why is this a deadbolt? Like a, hmm, I should put my desk in front of here. I ignored it and turned off my lights and sprinted to bed. I was around 12 to 13 here and my little brother, let's call him four, was very sensitive as well. 
He had been having a lot of trouble since we had moved into the house, full on seeing things, and even waking up outside. I heard him a few times in his closet, talking as if he was having a full out conversation with someone who wasn't there. Either way, this specific night he came to my room, which he often did, around midnight and asked if he could sleep with me. The perfect opportunity to be a big brother while also having someone with me because, to be completely honest, I was horrified. I had been hearing bumps and creaks all night. Fast forward a few hours, it's well into the night, most likely 3 to 4 a.m. I had been laying awake, as I often did because I was just flat out scared. I was a notoriously light sleeper, anyhow, but this night, I just seemed to lay there and not be able to move. My brother, on the other hand, was the opposite. If he had the chance, he could sleep through almost anything. All of a sudden, it felt like the temperature had dropped 30 degrees. I mean, we kept our house cold, but I swear the windows were frosting. Right about the time I'm starting to realize something is really wrong, I realize my little brother is holding me, just looking at the closet. But I was looking at it too. I felt it too. Then, clunk, the unmistakable sound that I and all my siblings knew so well. The lock on the closet somehow unbolted and the door began swinging open. There is no city light for a long time, so it's just moonlight shining through one window. It's pitch black in my room tonight, but somehow me and my brother both saw it. Something stood big enough to occupy a doorway and dark enough that we could see or feel it in the dark. I don't know. All I know is that is what terror feels like. We were frozen. I was holding him so tight he probably would have run looking back on the situation. What was all of seven seconds felt like minutes. All of a sudden, in the back of my head, like the furthest corner, I hear a voice. Not a friendly voice like the one that had led me out of trouble or talked to me in the woods as a kid. This voice had a grip on me, like it was just suffocating the life out of me, until I listened to what it said. Quote, I'm glad we finally got to you. (laughs) but it was laughing while saying it it was happy and then I realized it was coming from that closet then the closet door slammed shut like it was pushed by hurricane winds and I took my brother in my arms and took off downstairs in tears what a sight to be in front of your parents crying about a demon While my dad looked down on us with confusion, my mother's face said it all. She knew she had felt evil like this before. She knew we were telling the truth about it all. My life has only gotten weirder since. That night felt like the kickstart of it all. If you want the other weirder stuff, just let me know. That's crazy. That's pretty weird. I mean, just the the visual of that, that growing up in this house and all these doors have did bolts on mm-hmm. on the closets it's like a movie yeah. yeah and then his younger here's his younger brother talking to something in the closet at night in the closets that are bolted at night yeah just crazy apparently his family had a history his mom would speak to things or hear voices or i think his grandma too and i think his grandma might have been had to be put somewhere for the same reason according to him but anyways his whole account will be on our website but it is interesting too because of the closet doorways it just reminds you of the threshold thing we always yeah. talk about you know like it's yeah, it is very cinematic in a weird way, too. Mine's very 13 ghosts, kind of. Yeah, that's interesting. But yeah, it wasn't the end of the story. It was just kind of, I think, one of the climaxes of the weirdness. Well, thank you for sharing that. Thank you, Anonymous. Thank you, number two. All right. Are you guys ready for the next tale? We can move right along. Let's keep it moving. You want to go down under? This is actually from another listener. Uh, Cora Lee sent this in. This happened in 2023. Uh, I call it Girl in the Corner in Australian Haunting. And this, again, was another one that was part of a series of stories she sent in and this one I thought related well to our episode today. She says, Hey guys, my name is Coralie. I live in Australia and have been listening for a while now. I've experienced quite a few supernatural happenings and thought I should write in. 
I've got quite the history with ghosts, so I apologize in advance for how large this email will become. Maybe one of my stories will be useful for a topic someday. Well, this one is. To preface these stories, we are renters, so we moved around a bit. And this particular house my brother remembers as the ghost house. After we moved from the house, he said he never wanted to go back because ghosts were always standing behind him. Ew. At the time of these stories, I lived with my parents and younger siblings, who were aged between about 12 and 4 at the time. This happened about 9 or 10 years ago. Late one night, I woke to a girl standing in the corner of my room. I froze in fear and tried to blink away the image, thinking maybe I was still dreaming. I couldn't hear her, but it looked like she was screaming, and then she would run at me. All of a sudden, she'd be back in the corner and would again scream and run at me. This happened over and over again. I closed my eyes tight and pulled the blankets over my head. It took forever, but I eventually went back to sleep. The next morning I told my mom what had happened and she went pale and her jaw dropped. She told me that last night she kept hearing screaming and thought one of my younger siblings was having nightmares. She'd walk down the hallway, check all the rooms, but everyone was asleep, but she kept hearing the screams. I saw the ghost. She heard it. Weird. A further note on the happenings at the above house. I told my mom I was writing out all my experiences, and she said at that particular house I would sleepwalk all the time. At one point, I moved my four-year-old sister from one bedroom to another while asleep. Ooh. Yeah. Another time, I went into my other sister's room and woke her by standing over her staring. I apparently asked if I could sleep in her bed. Can I sleep in your bed? The poor thing was terrified. Another time, I had scribbled madly over my school book. So I don't know if that relates to the supernatural, but it sure is strange. Very strange, CJ. That, it's kind of weird, too, because, I mean, first of all, horrifying. A girl keeps running at you and screaming over and over in the corner of your room. You're seeing this thing all night. That's not good. You don't hear her scream, but then your mom hears the screaming all night. Yeah, but she doesn't and, but see she her. can't find where the scream is coming from. That's bizarre. It's like the mom was hearing the screams of the, the ghost or yeah. whatever it was. But then it's weird because then she finds out that she's been sleepwalking in that house and doing the same things almost that that in a way that that other girl was doing to her. Yeah. Peering in her sister's room and staring at her. I mean, eerie. Extremely eerie. So that was Australian, huh? Yeah. Thank you, CJ, for that. And the scribbling it reminds me of automatic writing, you know, oh, yeah, going to trance and mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, very interesting. Thank you for that. Yeah. It ties in well with today's episode. Yeah. Thanks, CJ. Okay. Let's mix it up for a second. So I wanted to look into interesting things about haunted houses in general. We kind of touched on this in the past a little bit. But I came across an interesting article called Haunted as a Matter of Law. Yes, and this is specifically, uh, I guess it connects to if you're moving to a place. Exactly. That may or may not be haunted. Which is why it works so well. So if you have a haunted house or, you're, or you want to buy a place and you're not sure if it's haunted or not, here's some interesting law to know. Disputes regarding failures to disclose material facts are common in residential real estate transactions, as we all know. A 1991 New York case dealt with the much less common issue of whether a home seller is required to disclose the presence of paranormal activity. We've talked about this before. Yeah, a little bit. In Stambosky versus Ackley, the court found that a home was, quote, haunted as a matter of law. So here's what happened. For years prior to the sale of the home in Stambosky, the sellers had reported the existence of numerous paranormal occurrences in the house. The hauntings ranged from unexplained sounds to full-body apparitions. During the time they owned the home, the sellers had disclosed these paranormal activities not only to a local newspaper, but the activities had also been the subject of a Reader's Digest article. Whether the sellers disclosed the hauntings to the buyers, however, was hotly contested in this case. The buyers claimed they learned of the activity only after they had signed the purchase agreement. And so then they refused to close as a result. The buyers filed an action requesting recession of the agreement and damage for fraudulent misrepresentation. The trial court dismissed the action, finding that the doctrine of caveat emptor, or buyer beware, barred the buyer's claims. But this is where it gets really interesting. 
the appellate court reversed the trial court's decision and reinstated the buyer's claims. This is basically what happened. The Stamboski decision is most famous for its finding that, quote, As a matter of law, the house is haunted. To the disappointment of ghost hunters, however, the court never determined whether the house was truly haunted. Rather, its finding that the house was haunted, quote, as a matter of law, merely conveyed its determination that the sellers were prevented from denying that the house was haunted as a result of their previous claims of hauntings made to the local paper reader's digest. The appellate court found that the reputation of the house as haunted would, quote, greatly impair the value of the property and its potential for resale. The court, however, missed the mark on this point. After the parties in Stamboski settled their claims, the house was sold to a third party at a whopping $600,000 premium. Wow. You're right? Is that a lot? Uh, for this house. Okay. Yes. Good for them. As a side note, some states, uh, this is kind of interesting, including Minnesota, have attempted to provide clarity in this area by statutory enactment. For example, a Minnesota stature makes clear that Minnesota's general duty of disclosure does not create a duty to disclose that the home was the, quote, site of a suicide, accidental death, natural death, or perceived paranormal activity. But interestingly, the statute leaves open the question of whether a death by homicide must be disclosed. I just thought that was kind of interesting. In, o- in Ohio, I guess it's just a rec- the law recommends that you let people know if it has a um, stigmatized reputation, ah. like a haunting or something. But they don't have to tell you. That's interesting. John, did you see that show? I think you did. The Watcher? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. You did. I'm pretty sure we talked about that. The Netflix series was about a house that someone was writing letters to this house. Oh, yeah. Remember that? Yeah. Did you know that's a true story? Really? Yeah. Like based on a true story? Based on a true story. Most of it, I mean, well, up to a certain point is true. That was a good show. It was a good show. I forget. I feel like it might have petered out a little bit, but the concept was really interesting. And in the expansion, we're going to talk about it a little bit because the backstory is actually really interesting. Hmm. The family that uh, owned that house. Don't spoil it. I won't spoil it. I'm just going to say, essentially, if you you don't know the show. They're vampires. (laughs) They are not vampires. Maybe. Uh, No spoilers. But... Essentially, someone was writing to the house, and so the new owners of the house, and this person writing was writing from the perspective of essentially like, my family has been watching this house for generations. My father watched this house, and his father before him. It was almost like a father writing to a prospective lover. It was (laughs) weird. Like, I'm watching you, I love this house, sort of thing. Yeah, there was an obsession uh, to it, and they would say creepy things like, I'm glad you have brought this young blood to the home. Has the young blood been to the basement? Has he found what's in the walls? Oh, I don't remember that part. I don't know if that was actually in the show. That was in the... But it's in the actual letters. So we're going to go over that a little bit just because the letters are super creepy. And I don't think it was ever solved. Or maybe it was. You'll have to come to the expansion to find out. But anyways, <laughs> that's going to be in the expansion. But that reminds me of this, Chris. Does the home have a reputation? Because in that case, they tried to sue the person who sold them the house saying, you never told us that right. there was this watcher. And they went through the court system. And so we're going to get into that, what happened with that. But it's really, really interesting story. So it is an interesting thing about haunted houses like that. Do you have to disclose? Yeah. I mean, I feel like just good karma, you definitely should. But then I feel like you should have to disclose if there's been a a murder, suicide. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, that's crazy that you don't have to in certain places. I just feel like that's what sucks is like you run the risk of losing out on tons of money because you know, the stigma that comes with the house. But at the same time, like... You need insurance on that house. <laughs> yes, you do. You need, like, like haunter, murder, death haunter's death insurance. insurance. <laughs> <laughs> no, murder, like, death insurance. Murder, death insurance, where you, like... Murder, if, death. Yeah. <laughs> if, you ha- if, you know, someone does something in the house like that, then you get, you know, when you sell it, you get the difference that of, That would like, be interesting. Yeah. 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 Haunted house value insurance. It doesn't even necessarily have to be, be haunted, haunted no. but just the idea that someone was... Yeah, the darkness there. there. Yeah. Tragedy. Most people, well, not most, but I'm sure some would, if they found out that something really bad happened, would not want to live there. No. But then do you incentivize people to murder people in their homes so that they can make more money? (laughs) Okay. Insurance fraud? (laughs) Tragedy insurance fraud? Oh, maybe. Dark. Yeah. Creepy stuff, but. Anyway, do we want to do one more story before we take a break? Sure. Let's do Nightwalker. This story came in a long time ago to us from Ben. Good guy, fellow Ohioan, I believe. This is a typical story of moving into a new home, maybe deciding to make some renovations on your own, and trying to sleep there in the night. About 20 years ago, when my wife and I purchased our first home, I moved into it as I was working on fixing it up. 
sleeping in the small kitchen on a mattress laying on the floor. One night, several hours after I had gone to bed, I was awakened by a noise. One of those that you don't know what it was, but know that there was a noise that immediately woke me wide awake. I sat bolt upright on the mattress, heart racing, and then I heard it again. It sounded exactly like footsteps walking across the floor. To lay it out, the furthest room from where I was was the bedroom, which opened into the living room, through another archway into the dining room, and then into the kitchen where I was, which also had the only doorway leading outdoors. I have never felt that kind of terror in my life. I literally could not move. I had a handgun in a cabinet within arm's reach, but I was so frozen that I couldn't even move to try and grab it. As I sat there, I could plainly hear the footsteps coming across the rooms. And I remember thinking, this is not the old house creaking. This is footsteps coming closer across the wooden floors. As I sat there, I remember being freezing cold, even though it was hot and humid at the time. The steps came right to where I was, which was within reach of the door to the outside. And that was it. The short hallway to the screen door had carpet on its floor, so I don't know if that's why the steps went silent or what but I remember that it warmed back up and the terror I felt quickly went away. I busted ass out the door and just stood outside for a long time trying to process everything that had happened before going back in and turning every light on in the house and checking every room in the house to make sure it wasn't a friend playing a prank. This whole episode lasted, I'd say, 15 to 20 seconds, and I was definitely as awake as I have ever been in my life. My only thought or theory was that maybe the old man that had passed away in the house during the prior year was leaving or deciding that we were going to take care of what was once his and was now satisfied so that he could move on. I never had another experience like that. Still, my wife and I always had an uneasy feeling in the house like we just weren't alone or that someone was watching us. We later found out that some people we knew were related to people that had lived there at the beginning of the century and they had a couple infants that had died and were known to be buried in the apple orchard. Anyways, that's when I made up my mind that there are definitely spirits around and among us and I've been a believer ever since. Thanks for letting me share my experience and keep up the good work. I respect all the time and research you put into your shows. Well, thank you, Ben. Yes. Yeah, that would be terrifying. We always wonder about renovations. Oh, right. What spirits do you wake when you are hammering into those walls? So it, it was interesting because he was, it sounded like he was sleeping in the kitchen or staying in the kitchen. Mm-hmm. And that was the only exit to the house. So when these footsteps were walking up to potentially like the spirit leaving, as he thought it might have been, uh, the only way it could do that would be over his living body. If he had, the spirit had to use the front door? Yeah, yeah. Well, as spirits, well, if you believe in spirits or whatever you think they are, even in the echo idea that, you know, if you were a ghost, you're like, oh, I'm just going to go out the wall. I'll go through the wall. But it's not, they don't operate that way. In most cases, it's... It's because where they were when they were here, right? Yeah. Like you hear those stories of, you just see the knees and up, right, of a spirit. Mm-hmm. And for some reason, it looks like they're sunk in the floor. And you find out the foundation was much lower. Right back then. Decades ago, maybe a right. century ago. And it's because... The house has been built up as, you know, layers of earth comes in, you see ghosts walking through the floor yeah. because they still are walking on the floor that they knew or that the echo is replaying. Makes sense to me. John, did you know that it's unlucky if you move into a home, walk in through the front door for the first time and then leave through another door? Because you will never find rest in your home unless you leave the door you come in the first time you enter. Is that an old wives tale? It's a superstition from different parts of the world. Ireland, I think an irish one mm-hmm. same with the salt you know you put it on the front doorstep keep out the evil spirits oh yeah it's a classic oh you shouldn't bring this is a feng shui thing but you shouldn't bring your broom from your last place into your house because it'll bring with you all the things in your life that you want to leave behind all the dirt 
So new brooms. Yeah, you're just bringing a fresh broom, so it brings in fresh energy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you jumped ahead, didn't you, Chris? I was just recalling from my research. Oh. Did you have that in here? Mm-hmm. Oh. Oh. That's right. I didn't know you had that in here. It's okay. Twins think alike. Well, that's all fascinating. And we will get into more superstition. Because I like that stuff. I like the, the superstition stuff. So if you will indulge me in the expansion, I might do a little bit of that. Yeah. What is coming up in the expansion, Chris? Oh, well, you mentioned the, was it The Watcher? Yeah, a little history of that story is going to be yeah. in there. We're going to cover some more moving stories, but some that are even more crazy and fun. In fact, I'm going to just play this short clip right here of uh, one story we're going to cover in the expansion. Oh, yeah, this is of, a great story. Uh, so this is a quote you're about to play as a, a fellow that moved to New Orleans. Right. Right. In, in the 1980s and has a run-in with a female werewolf when he's trying to get a, a date. I won't spoil it, but I just wanted to play a short clip. That would be the Rougarou. Yeah. This is why you have to be careful when you move. All I could see was like a silhouette. And Herman is not moving. And it's not growling. It's not snarling. <laughs> It's just looking him dead in his eyes. That's not a dog. What the f is that? That's what went through my mind. That's when terror kicked in, because now I can clearly see what I'm looking at. Shoulders, arms, everything on top, like a human female would have, just a whole lot bigger. Oops. <laughs> I'm like, this thing gotta be, it gotta be nine feet tall. And to see a hand come out of the dark when you're expecting a paw. I mean, a hand four times bigger than mine. A light went on and I said, that's a werewolf. I'm looking at a werewolf. <laughs> My brain is telling me, get the hell Anyway, we'll, I don't want to spoil it, but that's really good. Yeah, don't spoil if he gets eaten or not. What show is that? Yeah, don't spoil. <laughs> so, uh, he was regurgitated after he was <laughs> so eaten. So you can tell the story. <laughs> Well, I came across this story on that show we mentioned before, uh, These Woods Are Haunted from HBO. Oh, yeah. I, I watched the first episode. I did not like it. The first episode wasn't very Skip good. Skip it if you don't, because there are some really good episodes oh, in there. there. Yeah. Does it get better? Yeah. We're going to break this down. We're obviously not going to play the episode, but we're going to break down his story. It's really interesting. And I love it too, because it's, again, it's like a fish out of water story. Like he just yeah. moves to this city. New Orleans. Meets a girl in a storage. I don't want to spoil it, but it's really interesting how this plays out. Yeah. A uh, really interesting story. See, so, yeah, be careful where you're moving because some of the folklore of the region might come out to bite you but yeah so guys if you're not an expansion member yet go to beliefhole.com click on the big red join the expansion button sign up and you get all kinds of bonus episodes you get a bonus episode every time we drop a regular episode fully produced fully researched like that one there and now's a good time to do it because we will be having to push back the schedule a week so you might get a little lonely for some whole action now when you do sign up you get access to all of them all at once yes Yep. Yes. Over a hundred episodes. Fresh new yeah, content. So that little charge up front, you get access to all of our lives <laughs> the past four years, <laughs> sweat and blood. So check it out, enjoy it, and uh, enjoy this break and maybe use this moment to check every cupboard. If you're on YouTube, use this moment to hit the like, subscribe, bell notifications. If the yes. likes really do help us grow. So if you're watching this live, do, do us a solid. Yeah. Show us that you appreciate what we do and, and hit the like. Absolutely. And here is a clip from today's expansion episode. Take it away. All right, we'll be back after the break. Bye. Access granted. One night in June 2014, Derek Brodus had just finished an evening of painting at his new home in Westfield, New Jersey, when he went outside to check the mail. Derek and his wife, Maria, had closed on the six-bedroom house at 657 Boulevard three days earlier and were doing some renovations before they moved in. So there wasn't much in the mail except for a few bills and a white, card-shaped envelope. It was addressed in thick, clunky handwriting to, quote, the new owner. And the typed note inside began warmly, quote, Dearest new neighbor at 657 Boulevard, allow me to welcome you to the neighborhood. As Derek kept reading the letter from his new neighbor, it took a turn. How did you end up here? The writer asked. Did 657 Boulevard call to you with its force within? The letter went on. 657 Boulevard has been the subject of my family for decades now, and as it approaches its 110th birthday, I have been put in charge of watching 
and waiting for its second coming. My grandfather watched the house in the 1920s, and my father watched in the 1960s. It is now my time. Do you know the history of the house? Do you know what lies within the walls of 657 Boulevard? Why are you here? I will find out. To your new home. I hope you found it pleasant and not horrifying. Did you clean out all your cupboards of the froggers and the stowaways? The greasy men. The greasy men. Mm-hmm. That's what I assume hides in cupboards. That are watching you right now. If you're asleep in bed and you're drifting off for some reason to believe hole, get up and go check those cupboards. Check the closets. Check the closets. Check the closets. Crawl spaces. Crawl spaces especially. What's this next story? I think this one's kind of unique, Chris, isn't it? Yeah, this is a unique one. This is actually another one from a listener. Um, This is from Robin, and I call this Woman at the Window. And pay attention to the story, because there are some interesting twists and turns. Uh, This took place in Phoenix, Arizona in 2022. Oh, recently. Mm Mm-hmm. So when she wrote in, she started by saying that she never had any intentions of sharing the story initially, but she was listening to a past Strange Listener Story episode, and she heard a particular story that related to her. And she says, quote, it was the story of a girl who heard a party in her attic. <gasps> oh, yeah. Well, multiple people could hear it. And when they checked it out, the noise stopped. Anyways, I realized you guys are probably the best people to tell this one story of mine, too. That's probably true. You guys remember that story? With the girl? I do, yeah. Her friend was over and they, they kept hearing the party in the attic and they'd go investigate it. Oh, yeah. So, but this, this definitely has some interesting turns. Something I've never heard anyone bring up, but is fascinating. And we'll talk about that after the story is over. Definitely. So pay attention. Just last year, we had moved into a home right where Phoenix meets Avondale. This area has tons of construction projects going on from shopping malls to apartments being built. It's a nightmare area to live in right now. So we only stayed the year and then left. The women in my family are sensitives and we could feel there was something up about this home, but it didn't feel haunted. Nevertheless, I did a lot of prayer and cleansing of the home before we moved in. As far as activity, it didn't happen often. However, what we did encounter, my mother and I agreed that it didn't feel like a restless spirit or intelligent entity. It felt like memories. This is important for later. My mom would see someone walking down the hall. My youngest son told me his eyes were going crazy when he saw someone walk into a room through a closed door. My husband, who was quite the skeptic, once saw someone standing in our living room in the middle of the night. Now as for me, my encounters are quite different. One night, I woke up and could hear a woman singing. It sounded as if it was coming from an old-timey radio. I could hear enough that I believed she was singing in Spanish. However, the sound was too fuzzy to make out any words. I sleep with a white noise machine on, and I know at times your brain can try to make sense of the white noise, and you'll hear more audible sounds. When this happens to me, if I shift my head, the audible sound will turn into white noise again. However, this night, no matter how I shifted, I could still hear the woman singing. Although now, it sounded as if the song was over and someone was talking in Spanish. I shook my husband awake and asked if he could hear that. In a sleepy haze, he looked confused, so I asked him again. And at that exact moment, the voices stopped. I decided to just roll over and try to go back to sleep. On another night, Sometime later, 
I woke up to another voice. This time, it's a man talking very excitedly. He's laughing and speaking Spanish just like the last time. And just like the last time, it sounds like it's coming from an old-timey radio. I lay there for a moment, thinking it will go away. But this voice is much louder than the last one. Now I'm thinking someone must be in the house. I shake my husband awake and tell him to check the noise. I hear someone. I don't hear anything, he tells me, and gets irritated that he now needs to get out of bed. After he exits the room, I can still hear the man talking and laughing. I think my husband is never going to find him. He doesn't even hear him. In that moment, I jump out of bed to find my husband and help him search the house. However, when I exit the bedroom, I can feel this sudden shift in energy, and the voice is gone. That's when I realize how electrically charged our bedroom felt, because the energy just outside the door is so light. It reminded me of when I used a broken vacuum at work. I turned it on and immediately turned it off because I could feel an electrical current running through me. That's like a not grounded feeling. Yeah. My coworker even laughed and said my hair was standing on end. This is what my bedroom felt like when I could hear these voices. One night, I had a dream that I woke up in bed. I was drawn to the door that was to the left of my bed and it led to the backyard. I pulled back the curtain that hung over the door and looked out. However, I didn't see the backyard. I saw one of my younger sisters playing with our old dog in a very dirty bedroom. She sees me and gets up very slowly with fear in her eyes. She won't take her eyes off me. Suddenly, I wake up in bed and I know that I was looking into our old house we lived in between 2002 and 2004. That house was haunted, and my younger sisters would experience a silhouette press up against their bedroom window that faced the backyard from time to time. This dream seemed so crazy and real to me. I kept thinking about it the next day. This may seem just like a weird dream, but then I remembered a very distinct encounter I had in that old house. I was home alone in the den, and the den opened up into the living room. I am ironing clothes when I look up and there's an apparition of a woman standing in the living room. She has short dark hair, a dark t-shirt on, and blue jeans. I can't make out facial features because there's a black glow radiating from her eyes and its frayed edges are covering most of her face. I get mad that she's there and ask her, what do you want? She doesn't reply. She doesn't even move. She's just staring at me. I decide to just ignore her until she goes away, which she does. Fast forward back to the present and I realize that woman looked a lot like me as I look now. I just recently read Paul Eno's book, Dancing Past the Graveyard. I don't agree with everything he claims about the paranormal, but when it comes to his cross-brain theory of overlapping parallel worlds, it starts to piece together what I experienced. What if I was the thing haunting our old home from the single year I lived in a house that was clearly an intersect point. Fascinating idea. I know this sounds crazy, which is why I chose to tell you guys the story because I don't know any other paranormal podcast who is educated in the paranormal or as open-minded as the belief hole. Hopefully you find this story interesting. Thanks, Robin. Thank you, Robin. Yeah, that sounds like uh, like retroactive astral projection. Yeah. You know, like she is potentially astral projecting into the past, haunting herself yeah. and her sisters. Her sister? Yeah. Yeah. That's such a crazy, I mean, it's not crazy. It's, it's a unique idea, but I mean, with the idea of doppelgangers and just the, but the aspect of time travel or projection in the past Mm -hmm. is a really interesting concept. It's interesting too, because she said it felt like when she first moved in, her and her mother felt like it didn't feel like what was in there was necessarily a restless spirit, but, but the feeling of memory. Hmm. And then years later, she has dreams where she's going into this house and then she remembers that her sister's bedroom was haunted by a woman who would look through the window. Yeah. And now she's the woman looking through the she's window. She's having dreams of looking into the old bedroom right. from that perspective. Yeah. Is she the woman that was haunting her own home as a child just in the future? Yeah. I mean, it's mind bending, but very interesting. We talked a little bit about Dancing Past the Graveyard, Poltergeist, Parasites, Parallel Worlds and God by Paul Eno. Um, we've never done an entire episode dedicated to it, but we will. But That is one of his theories in there, the cross-brain theory. So definitely check that book out, guys. And thank you for that, Robin. Very unique story. 
We'll have to do an episode and then refer back to her story. Yeah, thanks for sending that in. Really interesting. Next. Ding! Uh, this next one, I like. It's kind of a sweeter story of uh, unexpected revelation upon finding a new home or moving into a new place. Hopefully we have an experience like this here, uh, where we have fairies. This is called the Fairy Garden, and this comes from the Fairy Census. This took place in Scotland, South Lancashire, South Lanarkshire, if I'm pronouncing that right. South Lanarkshire. And this took place between 6 and 9 p.m. and includes a woman and her husband, I think, in their, in their mid-40s, I believe. I have always been a bit of a believer and became more so due to a photo I took of my garden one day, which made me more curious. One night shortly after this, a summer evening at dusk, my husband and I were sitting in the garden pondering the jungle of a garden we were planning to transform and tackle in the coming week. We had just moved into the house, and the garden was a tangled, unsightly mess. We had been sitting in silence, surveying the mess, when I thought I could see a kind of sparkling effect amongst the tangled weeds. I tried to point this out to my husband, who did not see this. However, within the next few minutes, what had been the tangled mess of weeds was, to me anyway, suddenly transformed into what I can only describe as a beautiful garden, glowing and beautiful. I thought that perhaps it was just me that could see this, so I didn't mention it to my husband. Then he nudged me and said, For God's sake, look at the garden. He saw it too, and then he turned and looked at me and said, Oh my God, your face, you look like a teenager. And he was holding my face and staring at me in amazement. Of course, I dived into the house to find a mirror, but saw no difference. My husband said that as I ran in, the garden went back to normal. I can only assume that what was experienced was what is called in Scottish lore, the glamour. All around the garden are old stones built into short walls. In later years, I found out where the stones had come from. Near where I live, there is what was once a grand estate and is now a public woodland or glen with ruined castles. Near the side of the castle, there had once been a stone-built fairy well where people could sample the mineral waters of the well and make wishes. However, the well was reduced to rubble in the landslide. Local people in the 1960s helped themselves to the old stones for use as garden walls and edgings. And you may have guessed it, my garden is full of these stones. I believe it was a fairy because it was so embodied in the plant life in the garden. And if there are such things as fairies, in my own opinion, they are part of nature and plants, trees, and rivers. I mean, that's a fun story. If it's true, it's pretty awesome. That's the sort of paranormal experience I want. The glamour. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's cool because her husband, without her having to say anything to him, saw the same thing. Right. And then she apparently, yeah, was glamoured or became a, uh, engulfed in the glamour. And things became young and beautiful, you know, with the fairy world. That's interesting, world. like she was in the slipstream of the glamour. So the, the tangled garden became beautiful. She was, she was sitting close enough to it that she became fresh. Gained her youth. And, yeah. And you hear that, that kind of thing in fairy lore a lot. You know, you get stuck in these fairy parties, if you will, find them in the wilderness. And then right. people end up there for years when it only feels like minutes and then they reappear in the future. These legends and stories. But you have people who allegedly experience these kinds of things with the fairy circles. And fairies are real. Fairies are real. Yes! And I've come to believe that through our years doing the show. I've never thought I would think that, but I think it for sure. I think it, though, therefore, therefore it, it is. is. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It has been decreed. So these are one of these topics that I, going into the show, I was like, nah, fairies. If you guys are still unsure and you haven't heard our, our two-parter fairy episode, yeah. definitely go back and check uh, it out. Terrorized by gnomes. Disembodied hands. Yeah, disembodied hands, another one? Right. Oh, John, we got two more of those in the past week. Insane. Really? All the same, like, green skin, long hair, sometimes long fingernails, giant disembodied hands. Yeah, we had a giant one, too. It's just weird. It's just weird. Bizarre. We need to do... We have enough for a whole episode on it. We could probably write a book on it at this point. Yeah. Well, that's the plan. If you didn't believe in floating disembodied hands or wrinkly-faced gnome people that can crawl through your bedroom flower pots, think again. You're in the belief hole. I want a gnome kiss. <laughs> I, I want, want a gnome, gnome kiss. kiss. <laughs> <laughs> and you shall have it. Well, I think it's time to hear from a listener in their own words, their own experience. Oh, this one's a long time coming. Yeah, a lot, a lot of these are. It takes a long time to get through our archive. By the way, anyone who's listening and has submitted a story, 
thank you for your story. And if we get to them, we will, we'll either let you know, or you'll just hear them one day and be like, oh, they're doing my story. But we love you regardless. Yes, we do. And we do read all the stories. This story is from Jessica. She worked in Austin, Texas, and it was an interesting location to work in. And you'll hear why, but we're all familiar with this area. As we've all lived there for time. John, most, most time of all. It's true. Most time of all. Me second most. I didn't take the time to title this in a better way. So for now it is called Austin Workplace Haunt. Hmm. But it's sure is enough to make it more creative. Let me know. After, Colorful. Let, me know after, let us know in the comments below what it should have been titled. There you go. That's how you make it interactive on YouTube. That's right. <laughs> Hi, I wanted to share my workplace encounters that I experienced while living in Austin, Texas between 2012 and 2019. One evening, I was wrapping up things at work. I was tired and ready to end the day. When I looked up from my desk to see a wispy translucent figure gliding past my office. The office was a converted farmhouse in Round Rock, which is outside of Austin. The next day, I told my boss about it, and she had seen the same the morning of my encounter. Sometimes when leaving for the day, I would feel someone run up behind me like I was being brushed. Accompanied by the thought, don't leave. I know that wasn't my thought because all I wanted to do in that moment was leave. But there was a damn keypad with a code to enter, which made leaving quickly impossible. I hated that thing because I knew I had to contend with it when I could possibly feel that fear and that presence. I never, it never felt threatening or anything. It was almost like a, a plea of like, please don't leave me. Sad. It was interesting. I was always too scared to verbally acknowledge the possibility of a presence of someone else or something else. Um, I do regret not saying goodnight or see you in the morning. Aww. Coworkers claim to have seen apparitions, heard footsteps upstairs when no one was present, heard wrestling paper while sitting at their desks, had objects pushed off their desks by an invisible force. One coworker saw the bottom half of a man walking in the hangar, which was connected to our office building. One evening, while I was working alone, I heard something like shuffling feet or the rustling of paper from another office or from downstairs. I couldn't distinguish which. Another night, I heard the door alarm sound as if someone had entered downstairs, which is impossible because only office personnel had that entry code and the only workers on site were me and the few truck drivers pulling into the plant to end their shifts or getting into their cars to leave for the day. One day, a dark imp-like figure with glowing eyes and no distinguishable features snuck around the corner opposite my office. It looked like a two-dimensional shadow. I thought it was interesting the night before I was listening to a paranormal podcast and I thought, I want to see a ghost. Why do all these people see ghosts and I don't? What's wrong with me? The company is family owned and operated. From what I know about them and one coworker that I talked with extensively about our experiences is that they all experienced the paranormal at work and outside of work. They all lived in haunted houses. I did not live in a haunted house, to my knowledge, although um, I would experience things sometimes um, at home, which I don't know if I lived in a haunted house or not, um, and I don't, I don't want to uh, claim that, but um, I too had experienced uh, the paranormal outside of the workplace. Um, that was a season in my life of looking into the darkness. I think the darkness looked back. Thank you so much. Thank wow. you. Crazy. Interesting idea that all Hi, the people... I wanted to share Hi, you're back. <laughs> That's a bit of a loop. While living in Austin. I thought it was interesting when I heard that part of it too, where everybody who had worked there all came from haunted houses. Just, I just had this idea of like spirits pulling people on puppet strings, like by the individual places, uh -huh. leading them to places where others people might be haunted so that then they can gather 
Ooh. And then they can have a social hour. That's like a buffet. A spirit social hour. Yeah. And have some people appetizers. Fear buffet. Interesting story. Very interesting, Jessica. Thank you for submitting that. I wonder where that is. I definitely relate to that feeling of like when you're trying to get out at the last minute. Yeah. And you're stuck at the, the keypad, like the lock, and you're like, and you, that's like when you just feel like you're waiting for something to come up behind you. Yeah. Because yeah, it's a place you feel uncomfortable, you don't want to be, and you're like, okay, I just want to get out of this place. And then you, you know that every day you're stuck there, just having to get through the keypad part. John, were you close to Round Rock your first year there? No. You weren't? Oh, I thought you were North Austin. Lakeway. No, it was... Is that West? Oh, that's West, right? West, yeah. I was trying to think of where that might be. Interesting story, though. Yeah. Thanks for submitting that. By the way, guys, you can leave actual voice messages for stories as you just heard here. Uh, go to our website and click the... What is that one? What? The button to actually leave a voice message. I think it's confusing for people. I don't think a lot of people know they can do that. It is confusing. So what do they click? I'm not sure what it's called. Okay. Send a voice message or... It's at the bottom next to the contact form, okay. but I'll be redesigning it whenever God gives us time. And when you do leave stories, make sure you submit them through our website, beliefhole.com. Yeah. Because if you just send them to our email, they won't get saved to the archive. Exactly. If you go to beliefhole.com and click on the share your story button. Yes. Uh, thanks again, Jessica, for that great speak pipe. And as a final treat for you guys for this episode, for this new home horror, unsettling stories of moving, we have a great account. Which one did you want to do? Was it the crawl space? Yeah, that's that one. Oh, yeah. Okay. We have a great account of uh, a thing that was scary. Can you just mention it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys. And now for that extra special treat that we promised at the end of the episode. For those who are not expansion members yet, the full episode of this actually lives in the expansion waiting for you, thirsty for your arrival. So sign up to an expansion member. Here is a replay of that story called Crawl Space. Yes, there'll be a link in the show notes for the full expansion episode where this story is played. Awesome. And more stories like that. Here we go. This story is called Crawl Space. I have a phobia that goes by a few names. Scopophobia or ophthalmophobia, the fear of being watched. I have this weird compulsion. Whenever I see a doorway, a window, or virtually any surface that I believe someone could hide behind, I imagine a face peering out at me, staring. I imagine what I would do. What could I do? You will soon find out why I have this phobia. Around June of 2016, my mother and I were living in a small apartment. There was no basement or attic, obviously, but there was one tiny crawl space in the closet floor of my bedroom. I never looked in it. I suppose some people would be overwhelmed with curiosity, but my mind had already imagined all the worst scenarios. I decided to leave whatever dead bodies and ghosts were down there for whoever rented after us. It was a nice apartment, small, but perfect for the two of us. We lived there for a few peaceful months until the noises started. It was nothing extreme, just the odd bump in the night, and particularly, scratching. My mom just brushed it off as rats in the walls. As long as they stayed in there, I saw no reason to get rid of them. A week or two later, I had already grown used to the noise. It became almost comforting in a way. That is, until I awoke one night to a different noise. A rolling sound. Eerily similar to the sound my closet made when I opened it. I peeked my eyes open and looked over, but I couldn't make out anything in the dark. I thought maybe I saw something move, but I was well aware of how the mind plays tricks on you in the dark. There was only one way to find out. I turned on my lamp. When I turned on the light, I expected to see a closet full of coats, but what I saw was much, much worse. It was an eye. Not just an eye, but the entire half of someone's face, barely visible in the tiny crack he had opened. He didn't even react to being caught. No smile, no fear, just watching. My heart has never beat faster than that moment. I wish I screamed or maced him, but I just stared back, frozen in time until I couldn't hold it in anymore. I began sobbing loudly. 
I think I tried to say something along the lines of, What do you want? But it was garbled by my crying. He opened the door more. I could now see his entire body. Then a voice. I lost my breath at that. Hearing him made it real. I couldn't pretend it was some deranged hallucination anymore. When this happened, I sat up and pressed my back against the wall. It's okay, Teresa. He knew my name. This is when I finally had the courage to run out of the room. My mom, still half asleep while she called the police, thought I had imagined it. 911, what's your emergency? Of course, by the time the police got there, he was already long gone. All that was left of him was that damn crawl space. I still never looked inside, though writing this now, I kind of wish I did. Having some sort of proof of this would, I don't know, comfort me? Because at least you all would know I'm not crazy. Apparently he had been living in there. For how long, I have no idea but the officers who first arrived on the scene said that there were tally marks inside the crawl space. I didn't want to know how many. I didn't want to know whether he was marking days or weeks. I just wanted to leave that apartment. And we did. The police never found him. Not for certain. They thought they found a homeless man who matched his description, but he was apparently unresponsive. I've always thought that they didn't take it all that seriously. They just thought he was a squatter, even after I told them that he knew my name. They thought that given how long he had seemingly been squatting, he had probably just heard my name through the floorboards. Since that night, he has been the face I always see when there's an open door or closet. It's grown more distorted as time goes on, but I can always make out a part of his pursed lips, as if he's still shushing me. It's gotten easier with time but I don't think it will ever leave me completely. Anyways, I guess we didn't actually have rats. Well, we hope you enjoyed that story. Wasn't it neat? <laughs> <laughs> We're doing a, some creative recording and editing today. Yeah, in and outs, but... um. And now... And now, don't we have some super special people? Well, we have plenty of special people to thank, but first we have extra super very special people to thank. Known as, otherwise known as... Sky Whale Rider. Sky Whale Rider. Yes! Sky Whale Rider. Sky Whale Rider. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> first, we have, we have a chunk. We have a, a, a school, if you will, of Sky Whale. It's amazing. Are, do we else, a pod. A pod of Sky Whales mm -hmm. today. Amanda... Cast Castillon or Cast Cast man, I should know how to pronounce the name Amanda. Castellon? Castillon. She's been Castillon. A, she's been here before, right? Oh, she's been around. Yeah. I was she's supported, say. but she is she just hopped on a, on a whale and she the sky. cranked it up to Yeah, she's been around for a long time. Amanda, you are a hero. A hero to the whole. Absolutely. A sky whale, an extra generous, extra generous donor. We really do appreciate your your generosity. Uh yes! riding on the back of that sky whale is another sky whale by the name of Benjamin Widowson. Yes, and actually, I randomly found that he is a uh, game developer. Apparently, awesome! Oh, it, really? it popped up when I looked up his name on our on our Patreon. Build us a game. That's awesome, man. Yeah, I've done a lot of sound design work for actually, video looks, games. It looks like pretty sweet stuff. So we're looking forward to seeing what you're putting out, brother. Thank you so much thank for your you. generous support. Yes, seriously, very much. Thank you deeply. And to crack it off the top, I don't know if that makes sense. Uh, <laughs> Brandon Hinman is our champion Skywheel rider of the day. Because he invested in a whole year of belief hole at the Skywalk. What? Unbelievable. The generosity. Unbelievable. Sir, you are actually going to be helping us treat this brand new studio space with acoustic treatment with that unbelievably generous donation. What a man. Much needed acoustic treatment. You were doing some good work, sir. Thank you so much, brother. And thanks to all of you amazing Skywheel writers. You are keeping the show going. You are not only keeping us going, you are helping us achieve... Helping us to thrive. Helping us to thrive. The whole wants to thrive. We're practicing Sir Thrival here. Sir and Thrival. That, that's because of <laughs> like you. That. Did you make that up? That's good. I don't know. Probably not. No. Oh. Never mind. Sure. Anyway, <laughs> thank you guys so much. And now we shall move on to the other, but also very special... Extremely. Black-eyed cool kids. End up. End up. Supporters of the show. Thank you, too. Don't get angry. 
get happy, because Caitlin Angers is here. Oh, confusing prompt. Yeah, I'm mad. <laughs> <laughs> that laugh was so weird. You <laughs> both sounded like jovial old men laughing at the same time. <laughs> yes. Anyways, Caitlin Angers, you make us happy. Welcome in. Thank you, Caitlin. Pernilla Asperstrand is here, everybody. Oh, yes. What a beautiful name. Beautiful what name. Beautiful if I name. pronounced it right. Thank you so much, Pernilla. We, we, we really tried to figure out how to pronounce this name. Pronounce it exactly right, but it's it's not easy. It's unique for us. It is very unique. I think it might be Norwegian. Pernilla is what the sound a shooting star makes. Is it? Yeah. That's beautiful. In my mind. It must be an ancestral link to us because we are Norwegian as well. We're all related. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Pernilla. Seriously. We really do appreciate the support. Uh, Steve Messina, come on down to the hole. Welcome in, Steve. Steve yes. messing with us. Steve is messing with us in a good way. Okay, <laughs> weird. <laughs> sounded weird. Uh, Sandra D, <laughs> hi and welcome in. How are yes. you? Sandra D. D is my second favorite letter after C because my name is Chris. Excellent. Okay, <laughs> thank you, Sandra. She was, by the way, a dogman whisperer, I should have said. Oh, oh nice. Oh, 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 oh. oh, oh. That's very subdued. Dogman. <laughs> Weird. We'll get a real effect in there. Isaac Hughes, hello. Isaac. Isaac, yes, uh, yes, Isaac yes. Hughes. A good old friend of the home. Mm. Welcome in. Welcome, brother. Taking cues from Isaac Hughes. Yes. David Anderson is here. Anderson. 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 Oh, that's different. Is that a typo? Give me some, Anderson. Unless I typed it in wrong. I think yes. that's what it is. Dander, yes. Dander Anderson. Yes. <laughs> Welcome in. David Anderson. Thank you so much, brother. Welcome, David Anderson. Welcome to be here. Ooh. Kathleen Taylor, hi and hello. Ooh. Welcome Knit in. me up something special. It's a 60s actress name. It sounds like a classic, classical mm-hmm. actress. Mm-hmm. Kathleen Taylor. You are beautiful and we love you. Quinberly. Well, hi. Uh, I love that name. I feel like we've done that one. Done this one many times. Once at least. I, I think we've already done her, and then we were, did her again, and we were like, did we already do her? Maybe. She must be getting tired. Yeah. Yes. Well, welcome in. If you make it in, good for you. Yes. yes. We're still happy to see you, Quinberly. Welcome to be here. Jeremy G. G, what are you up to? Okay. What? <laughs> I don't know. I'm so sorry. Welcome in, Jeremy. You have my brother's name. Uh, I'm embarrassed for yes. you. Welcome, Jeremy G. <laughs> You're an OG here in the hole. Christine McGrew. Ooh, she's got a crime to solve. Sure. Sounds like a good detective name. It does. Me. Welcome in, Christine. Christine yes. McGrew. We're happy to have you. Matthew yes. Burgess. Hi. Oh, Matthew Burgess. Hi, Matthew. He's been around for a bit. Welcome to be here, Matthew Burgess. I recognize your name. Yes. We love you. We're happy to see it. Moonbeam Hallows. Wonderful. Is here. Beam my moon. Be my, my moon. moon. That's the best you can do with that one. <laughs> Moonbeam Hallows. It sounds like a. It sounds like <laughs> That's a. The best you can do. It sounds like a candle shop in Salem, Massachusetts. There you go. There you go. Moonbeam Hallows. Welcome yes. in. Stacy and Brog. Ooh, yes. are here. Yes. Wait, and they are a combined dog band whisper. Stacy <gasps> and Brog. Oh my gosh! I'm so excited. Welcome. Wag that dog. Oh. Derek or Derek. It's probably Derek. With a Q? It's with a Q, though. Oh. oh. Fancy. Yes. Welcome in, Derek. Derek or yes. Derek. Welcome to the hole, brother. We are happy to, happy to see you here. Amanda Cox. All well, right, Amanda. We're going to leave that one alone. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, you know our fan chickens? Amanda Cox <laughs> makes awesome. beautiful socks. Yes. And she um, fertilizes female chickens. She fertilizes down by the docks. Mm. Okay, that sounds really <laughs> weird. <laughs> Amanda <laughs> Cox. Because usually down with the docks where prostitutes hang out. She fertilizes. De- what is she fertilizing? <laughs> I was just rhyming with cocks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Anyways, we were very happy to have you, Amanda. You said fertilizes, and then I was going to say down by the docks. I'm so sorry. Your probably... mind went to the gutter. Mine didn't. Yours went to the docks. I said roosters. Welcome in, Amanda. Welcome in, Amanda. We are sincerely grateful to yes. have you. All joking aside with our stupid uh, childish, childish banter. Behavior. Yeah. We love yes. you, and we appreciate you being here. Zoe B. Hi. Zoe B. Zoe B. B. Zoe B. Cool. Zoe B. In the hole. Sounds like a Nickelodeon show. And we'd be thankful. It, it does. does. In a good way. Or a character on Nickelodeon. Let's pitch it. <laughs> Welcome in. Amy from Akron. Oh, shnikes. Oh, just down the road. From yes. Akron. Amy from Akron. She's getting close. What's yes. up, Amy? Is that what her name is? Amy yeah. from Akron? Oh, I, I wonder... didn't just intuit no, that no, she's... No. <laughs> yeah, I guess not. I wonder if we know her. Maybe. Do we know you, Amy? If we do... Give us a sign. She did Give let us, us know she was from Akron. That's true. <laughs> well, Welcome. It's a pleasure to meet you in well, the hall, you're just Amy. down the street, Amy. Yeah. Maybe we'll bump into you at the grocery store someday. If you ever someday. need any salt or sugar, just not. <laughs> well, let's not get carried away, Jeremy. I'm not one to I'm travel to people for salt and sugar. Niche <laughs> Pew. Excuse me? Niche Pew is here. Niche Pew. I think that's how you pronounce it. Yes. Welcome to you, Niche Pew. Yes. Or Niche or niche Pew. Yes. Puh. Niche Puh. It's a, like a G-H. Hmm, interesting yeah, name. It's a, it is a curious name. I like it. Welcome to be here. My uh, 
vocabulary of names is not great. Sorry if we screwed that up. Yeah, I am. I am it's sorry. Not intentional. We're not just not. You know, we can't know every name. Yeah, that's true. But thank you for being here. We do really appreciate your support because you are a freaking dogman whisperer. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> that was. Will 510 is here. Hi. Will 510? That sounds like an area code. That sounds familiar. Like, uh, like Texas. Excellent. Or is it height? Excellent. Or it could be height. That's that's my height. 510. Believe it or not. Jeremy's 5'9", by the way. Why, why did you point at me? Like an accusation. <laughs> Jeremy's 5'9", though. And no, that's not true. I am 5'10". I got a lynch on him. I'm 5'10". Then I'm 5'11". I'm like, you got the humpback, Anyway, though. anyway. Oh, humpback. <laughs> like a sea yes. mammal? Matthew Yednak is <laughs> sky, here. Sky mammal. <laughs> Welcome in, Matthew. What is it? Med, Medpack? Yednak. Yednak? Yednak. Yednak. That's an awesome name. I love that name. Matthew Yednak. Welcome in, Matthew. Welcome in. Yes. I love these interesting names. Sounds like a camel breed. Yednak. The Star Wars creature. <laughs> Get out of the Yednak pit! <laughs> <laughs> it's a sarlacc. Oh, sarlacc. Welcome in. I love it. I love your name. Welcome. Sincerely, Matthew. Well, I'm having an aneurysm. Yes. <laughs> and what? a brain cramp. <laughs> what? <laughs> a brain cramp? Yeah. Oh, okay. Chris just has a seizure in front of us. <laughs> Get the yet kit. Get the med kit. <laughs> med bag. <laughs> Okay. Okay, holy lord, let's move it along. Uh, yes. Stoking the fires in the hole like a good holer should. William Ash is here. Ooh, nice. William Ash. Burn us to the ground, What sir. a cool last name. Burn us to the ground. <laughs> <laughs> Death wish on ourselves. I mean, I don't know what I meant by that. I just sounded meant, cool. Uh, we're on fire for you. Yes. We're on fire for you, sir. We love you. Ray Bermudez is Ooh, here. Bermudez triangle. Yes. And Ray is three letters and a triangle has three sides, therefore... <gasps> Ergo. Therefore. He is the Bermuda Triangle. Yes. <laughs> in human form, reaching out from the void. Welcome, Ray. Yes. Yes! Megan Sonnenmoser is Ooh, here. Nice, I like that. Welcome to be here, Megan Sonnenmoser. So, uh, Sonnenmoser. Yes, we love you. That is a pretty name. Sonnenmoser sounds like a machine you would use to run over large vats of ice cream. <laughs> What? Okay. <laughs> that is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Ah, Rick, get the sun and Moser out. All these batches went bad. <laughs> Maybe it's like an ice cleaner. Yes. An ice cleaner. I like that Son and Moser. Yes. I guess it's got that Z sound, so it sounds like it is, does sound like operational. What is the machine? What is the machine called that cl that uh, cleans the ice? The I have no idea. And you're gonna ask that. It's a ice. It's mower? a very specific name. It's a sun and Moser. <laughs> but I think it's kind of close. It's is like it really? a, it's like a Henzeniner. <laughs> Henzeniner. That's it. Uh, Ice Hoosier. <laughs> Look it up real quick. What is it, Robot Woman? Zamboni. Thank you. <laughs> we'll know that in the future. <laughs> it is. Oh, the Zamboni. <laughs> Shut up. I knew a Zamboni. Rachel. Jerry kind of dated her. Kind of. I didn't date her. She was a cool girl. Who don't you date? It's a Zamboni, yes. It was close to Salmonheiser or whatever. It had a Z in it. Yeah. A it, Zamboni. It was at the beginning. Anyways, let's that continue. That is amazing. Probably the guy who invented it. All right, moving along. Okay. Austin ha Hageman or Hageman or Hageman. <laughs> Welcome in Austin. Any of those three. We are so happy that you're here. Okay, yes. from now on, everyone record. If they really want us to say it right, no, I'm joking. Yeah, it's because they, they have to email <laughs> that us separately. That really, really <laughs> di difficult. We just have to just accept our, our human fallibility. Please forgive our, our mistakes yes. on these. Can't correct them all. We're not superhuman. But we do appreciate your support sincerely, especially Austin, because you are a dogman oh. whisperer. Nice! We have maybe read more last names than a, than a retired teacher. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually a really great comparison. Bueller. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Bueller. Welcome in, Austin. You are Austin as man's best friend. Yes! Oh, by the way, Ray Bermudez was a dogma with Spurno for a second. Oh, nice. So extra howl for you. Nice. We'll get a howl for you. Lisa Whitney. Hi. Welcome in. Welcome yes. to be here. Lisa Ooh. Whitney. Welcome to the hole. It must have been mm. confusing during roll call in class. Two first names. Whit Whitney Lisa. That's a great yes! comment, Chris. Welcome. We love you. Thank you, Lisa. Sincerely. Beautiful names, both of them. They are. Albert Lee the third. Oh, my gosh. Are we in the presence of royalty? I think sometimes it takes three tries to get it yes! right. And they did it with Albert Lee the third. What are you saying about his dad and grandpa? They're, I'm sure they're great, too. I'm just saying Albert <laughs> Lee is probably... Our patron is the best. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you for your support, Albert. Seriously. Uh, <laughs> fangirl, fangirl, fangirl. Yes. Oh. I don't know if she's three fangirls yes. in one or... Like a Russian doll. Maybe three. Mm -hmm. Probably yes. just an excited version. Yes. I like it. Thank you, fangirl, fangirl, yes. fangirl. Yes. Fangirl, fangirl, fangirl. I only wish I knew your first name. I'm sure it's a pretty one. Maybe it's Fran. Fran girl. Fran girl. <laughs> That's really dumb. <laughs> I'm sorry. Jason Paul. What's up, brother? Jason Paul. Sounds like a model. Welcome to be here. Welcome in. I'd wear your cologne any day. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> Anyone with two first names. And he's a Donovan Whisper. Should have said. Nice. Should have led with that. Bury the lead. Fetch. Thank you, Jason. Fetch. <laughs> Start making new tricks. <laughs> Welcome in. You are loved. Sharon Wozniak yes. is in the frickin' hole. Now that's a good name right there. That's a great name. Heard that name. That's a classic. A TV show or something. Steve Wozniak was oh, he yeah. the co-founder of Apple. Yes. yes. Yeah. He did all the actual work. Yeah. For yes. the, the building of the things. I knew I heard that last name somewhere. I could be wrong, but I think I'm right. Sharon, we love to see your name in the hole. We appreciate awesome. you being here. You are the apple of our eye. Excellent. Dom Cam of or Dam Cam of Dam Talk. Don't just obey. Dam Talk just don't obey. Don't wait. I got that wrong. Dam Cam of Damn talk, don't just obey. Guys, how do you, do, when you spell okay, that's Dom, probably. D A A M N? Or is it damn talk? I don't know. I don't know. Okay. If I said that wrong, I am very sorry. Welcome in. Damn Cam of Damn Talk, Don't Just Obey. Okay, well, we did our best on that we one. We did. That was a tricky <laughs> one. It's spelled interestingly. We'll talk to you. Thank you, brother. We really sincerely appreciate it. And finally, our last name for the night. Ladies and gentlemen, please let me to introduce you to the whole to be here. <laughs> Laura Narwalt Narwaltimer Desliu. <laughs> yes! Gosh, I tried so the best hard. for last. That is a beautiful, crazy, awesome name. Mm. Laura Narwaltimer Desliu. Excellent. Wow. Is that all one word at the end? No, it's yes. Desliu is the last. Oh, it's like a hyphenated. Narwaltimer is the yes. middle, and then La Laura is the first. That's beautiful. That whole name is beautiful. I nailed Laura. I got that part right. You did. You got that part. Anyways, thank you so much, Laura. Yes. We truly appreciate you being here. And to all of you amazing supporters of the show, Black Eyed Cool Kids and Up, you guys are true here's the whole, and you help us grow yes. this thing to something greater than it was the day before. Amen. Well, that's it for today, friends. Yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. And yes. There'll be more thank yous for people next time. Yeah, we got a lot to get through still. Yeah. And remember, we will be taking an extra week to get this base going. Yeah, we we'll hope you guys like this episode. Yeah. Uh, check those crawl spaces, kids. You never know who might be living in your home. <laughs> Sorry, that's really creepy. Uh, <laughs> but you don't know. There, there could be things. There could be spirits. Let us know if you run into anything strange in your new place or if you have in the past. And thank you to everyone who's contributed stories for today's episode. Yes, absolutely. We will catch you three weeks from now. That's right, guys. We'll see you next time on Beliefful. saw it too and then he turned and looked at me and said in more scottish <laughs> oh my god <laughs> that's passable am i are, I get your face your face oh my god your face you look like a teenager <laughs> you that's, that, that's, that's workable close. you look like a teenager am i supposed to be scottish again yeah, it's the same guy did i do the first one that way kind of for fuck's sake Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> close. Oh my god! Your face! You look like a teenager! <laughs> <laughs> that could work in, in context. 